Good morning, everybody. Uh, Scott, uh, my faithful uh, reporter here, says, I see you, Pastor. Hopefully I'm on, um, and hopefully you can hear me. Hallelujah. We'll get, we'll get started in a moment. <clears throat> We're welcoming everybody to Lord of the Harvest and our live stream this morning. Uh, we have decided with just some of the things that are going on uh, in our congregation right now to uh, live stream this Sunday, and we'll, uh, we'll determine what to do in the future. So uh, we're glad that I can see everybody uh, is, is checking in, so praise the Lord. All right, uh, we're going to open with the Word uh, following... Um, uh, the, the opening scripture and prayer. Pastor Jan will be uh, doing the communion message, and then I'll be doing uh, the message, the sermon, if you will. So we're going to start with Psalm 12 today. Now, uh, at Lord of the Harvest, for those of you who are new, we've been going through the Psalms. We started with Psalm 88 on the 88th day of the year, that was back in uh, late March, early April, we went through 88 to 150, and then at day 151, we started back through Psalms 1, and then again went through 150, and then when we got to day 301, uh, just about two weeks ago, we went back to Psalm 1, because we, we want to really press into what God has to say for us concerning these psalms. We really believe that Lord of the Harvest, he's really speaking to us clearly. Psalm 1 is part of, Psalm 1 through 41 is part of the Genesis book of Psalms. And we're looking for a new beginning for the church right now. And so we're trying to find strategies from the psalms for a new beginning. Today is actually Psalm 13, and Pastor Jan will be doing that for the communion, so I'm going to start with Psalm 12. Psalm 12, I'm reading out of the ESV, and the uh, it's a psalm of David, as we see in the superscription, the heading of the psalm, and verse 1 says, Save, O Lord. It doesn't say save us, it says save, O Lord. For the godly one, the chassid, the chesed one, those who have become godly and righteous because of the Lord's steadfast love, the godly one is gone. The faithful, those loyal to the truth, have vanished from among the children of man. We, we see this, this disappearance and erasure uh, being blotted out, the, the righteous ones, the faithful ones, the godly ones. And, and what do we see in its place? Everyone utters falsehood to his neighbor with flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Their lips flatter, but they have a double heart. They, what, what appears to be good is, is not good. Uh, there's, 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 there are just, there's manipulation going on. And David seeing this, the psalmist says, may the Lord cut off all flattering lips. The tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say with our tongue, we will prevail. We have a lot of competing narratives going on right now in our country in the world, in the church. A lot of competing narratives and people who are arrogant, Scripture says, people who are proud say, we will prevail with our tongue. Our narrative will prevail. Our lips are with us. Who is master over us? And that's, that's David reporting the dilemma. That's his cry to God to deal with these things. And then... A prophetic word emerges. God answers in verse 5. Because the poor are plundered, because the needy 
groan. I will now arise, says the Lord. The Lord says, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to arise. Now, if you've been reading the first 12 Psalms so far, there, there have been calls in a number of those Psalms. Arise, O Lord, arise. And finally, the Lord says in the 12th Psalm, I will arise. And I'm going to arise because of the falsehood, because of the vanishing of those who are sustained by my steadfast love and those who are loyal to the truth. I will arise with deliverance, salvation for the vulnerable. The Lord says prophetically, I'm going to do this. And then verse 6. Now remember, David's talking about words, the power of words, the words of falsehood, the power of duplicitous words, the power of false flattery, smooth words that are there to manipulate people. There's a contrast. After the Lord says, I'm going to arise, what emerges? His word is going to speak forth. The words of the Lord are pure words. Now, that's not the normal word, Hebrew word for word, which is davar. That's imra. And imra means promises. And it, it, even the implication in the Hebrew is prophetic promises. The prophetic promises of the Lord are pure prophetic promises. The promises of the Lord are pure. They're not mixed. They're not duplicitous. They're not flattering words. They're not double-hearted words. They are truthful words. His promises will endure. The promises of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Something that was purified seven different times, all the dross is removed, and you have pure silver. And then David finishes, you, Lord, will keep them. Keep your people. Keep your poor and needy and afflicted and broken ones. Keep your faithful ones, those who are loyal to the truth. Keep your godly ones, those who stand for you and your steadfast love. You will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever, the generation of falsehood the generation that says their words will prevail over the word of the Lord, and the Lord says no. That's interesting because the Lord doesn't say he's going to put an end to the falsehood, but he says in the midst of that falsehood, he's going to preserve his people. Because on every side, the wicked prowl. They're, they're still out there, the wicked. As vileness is exalted, worthlessness, vileness, ungodliness, evil, as vileness is exalted among the sons of men. So even though, even though man might exalt vileness, the word of the Lord shall prevail. So Father, we open this service today and we ask, Lord, let your word be true in the name of Jesus. Well, good morning, church. Um, back to the house again. But, and I do really prefer being with all of you. Um, I feel like I'm talking to myself <laughs> when I'm doing this. But anyway, we're gonna, we, are, we are going to read out of um, Psalm 13 for the communion message. And we're going to follow what Pastor said. Uh, I'm going to read it first, and then we'll go back and talk about it. But one thing I do want to comment on was last week Joe Vanderbess shared the communion message, and it was powerful. It was beyond powerful. You know, he talked about what does the elements mean to you? Is it just a, a juice and a wafer? Is it what? What does it really actually mean to you? And and that really hit me. It hit me hard. And I wanted to say that. I wanted to stand up and, and applaud Joe because he took us through examples where Jesus had an opportunity to do what we might do. Say, you know, forget it. I'm just going to annihilate this group of people because I'm God and I can do that. Or I am not going to carry this cross. I'm going to get someone else to carry it for me. And I'm not going to die on this cross, this horrible death. I'm going to come down and figure out, you know, a different way to die. But it's not going to be like this. See, Jesus... 
did what the Father asked him to do. And everything was purposeful. Everything was exact. And sometimes in our lives, we don't understand what God is doing in our lives. We do not understand. And so what do we do? We lash out. We might lash out at our at our family members. We may lash out at our friends. We may lash out at God himself. But we have to remember that we are all in God's hands and we are all in a plan he has for us that will touch other people's lives. It's just not about me. It's just not about pastor. It's about all of us together. And when that is broken, when there's a breach there, things um, don't always run as smoothly as God would like. But he, remember, is God. And no matter what we do, he's able and ready to intervene. So in Psalm 13, it starts out with, How long, O Lord? How many of us have said that and cried out to God? How long? And we pray and we pray and we pray. How long? How long? How long? When are you going to answer this? When are you going to see the and hear the cries of your people? How long will it take? How long, oh Lord, will you forget me forever? You know, I know someone uh, who would say to my husband and uh, me all the time, I pray, but I don't feel God. I, I, I don't hear God. And that was a shame because God was with him. God was always with him. How long would you hide your face from me? God doesn't hide his face. When we rely, though, on our feelings, do I feel God? Then we can get into trouble. Because the word tells us he will not leave us or forsake us. So whether I always feel his presence, he's with me. How long shall I take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? You know, that's a really good one for us, isn't it? It's like Charles Spurgeon said, it's like taking a pill and letting it set on your tongue and just keep thinking about the pill rather than swallowing it and get rid of it. And that's what we do many times with our own sorrow. We just meditate on it and meditate on it and meditate on it. And let's just passing it through, getting it over, just and turn to God and say, help me. We don't, we cannot get help from our own selves. And I'm not saying we just sit on the couch and wait for things to come. I'm not talking about, I'm talking about God in his supreme power is taking care of us. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? You know, four times David cried out, how long? How long? Talks about his feelings. He talks about his thoughts. He talks about spirituality. He talks about being circled by enemies. And we've all felt that way. We felt like we're alone. We're abandoned. But God has never abandoned us. Scripture says, consider, consider and hear me, O Lord, my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemies say I have prevailed against him. Lest those who trouble me rejoice when I am moved. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Now we all know the scripture. This is a scripture we pray uh, many times over youth, um, especially when they graduate from high school or going away to college. But we also pray it at presbyteries when um, when uh, God is speaking. And this is in Jeremiah, and you all know it, 29, starting with verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I have. For I know the thoughts that I think. For I know the thoughts that I Cherish toward you, plan, says the Lord, hope, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. You know, what's interesting is our plans may be radically different than God's. And I can tell stories and stories how, 
you know, my husband and I had it all planned out. He was going to get a teaching job and that never happened. And we were devastated because the job he had wasn't so great. And we were really struggling. I remember our first Christmas or second Christmas, he bought me a Winnie the Pooh. Who adult woman wants a Winnie the Pooh for Christmas? But he bought it really for my baby daughter. And, um, and I was so immature, I was like crushed that he would buy me a Winnie the Pooh. But you see, when I look back at all that, I know it was purposeful. God did not want him to get a job teaching because in the schools because he would have settled there. God had other plans for him to move him out of that situation and into ministry. And it all began when he worked in Detroit Public Schools and he worked with um, a diverse population and he worked with a poor population and all of a sudden his eyes were open and trust me, our lives were never the same. So he says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. That's the secret. When you are in a trial that you think is going on way too long, don't hold that pill in your mouth, swallow it. Don't moan and complain to yourself. Go to God and pray and pray. And as long as it takes you pray until God answers. Now remember, the answer may not be how you expect it to be. And that's what, you know, where God is really moving me right now. To be in tune with the Holy Spirit. To be really in tuned. And to say to my soul, rest. Be at rest. Because where God is taking you is not where you think you, you want to go. Or you should go. God is taking you. Taking me. In a place that I didn't expect, in a way I didn't expect, on a path I didn't expect. So then you'll call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you and you will seek me and find me when you search with me with all your heart. See, that's the thing too. We say we pray, we say we search, but do we with our whole heart or do we just get on our knees and make the petition and then, oops, I just dropped my Bible. And then we move on. And then we're done. We prayed the prayed. Why didn't God answer? What's wrong with him? Now, when Joe shared last week, it just made me realize that I am so guilty of, of not valuing the cup, not valuing the, the wine and the bread as I should. I, I take it Sundays, and I don't really always think about what went into that? What went behind that? What Jesus did and through all of that. I want to finish with in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, um, verse, um, let's see here. Let's look at verse 26. Um, you know, Jesus spoke so many things to us. He walked with the disciples for so long. And then he said, um, these things I've spoken to you while being present with you, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. You know, in this hour, there's a lot going on. There's a lot of distractions. And we've talked about that before. The world is trying to drown out the Lord's voice. But he sent us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will guide you in this hour. You know, when I watched Joe share, and I think the week before his wife Teresa shared, I watched two people relying on the Holy Spirit for their message. They didn't have notes. They didn't, didn't read anything. They were led by the Holy Spirit. And I really believe in this hour, that's what it's going to take for us. That's what we're going to find the come to the point where we know that God is listening. When we see things happening, when we, when we follow that voice that speaks to us, that's when 
that's when we're going to see God moving, when we listen and obey. So when we look at the cup, we must remember how Jesus obeyed. We must remember how he sacrificed. And we must remember how he rose again. He became victorious. And that's our plan, too. We, do need, we will suffer. And we will sacrifice. But there will be the cross and there will be resurrection. Hopefully, we will see with our own eyes the resurrection. We will see with our own eyes what God uses us for. So saints, pray. If you find you're in a place that you're not, you're not sure, when you say to yourself, how long, oh God, how long is it going to take? Pray. And really pray. Not just once or twice, but spend time really beseeching God. How long, oh Lord? And he will. He will answer you in his time. So, now let's get our elements. All right. Dear Jesus, this is so significant for us. So significant. It's just not a cracker, a wafer, a cookie, whatever. It represents your suffering. And it was so beyond our imagination. And when we eat of this, we're saying we are one with you. We are willing to do what you did. We are willing to serve you despite our own wishes. To serve you and humble ourselves in a direction that would reflect you, dear God. Not with our mouths so much, Lord, but with our actions, may we represent you on this earth, dear God. May we always be humble. Because you said the humble will seek God. You said that, Lord. So in Jesus' name, make us humble. Amen. And Lord, I drink the cup. I drink the cup again of your sorrow that became joy, of your struggles that became victories, Lord. Help all of us, Lord, to take the cup as you took the cup and drink and to go forward as you went forward, Lord. Obeying the Father, listening to the Holy Spirit, and becoming victorious. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. And I'm going to turn over to Pastor now. And have a very blessed day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Jan. I did have a couple, uh, uh, an individual text me and said the sound uh, was good, but it was uh, not loud. I don't know if a lot of you are experiencing that. Uh, we've Got ours turned up here as well as can, and I know the Elliots are doing a great job at their house. Keep in mind, if you need to, for any reason, the sound or the quality of the sound is not good. Everything that we share here on the live stream will be uploaded on the Lord of the Harvest website, both as a video and as an audio podcast. So you can always, of course, go back and listen. So, I have several, several things I want to accomplish here as far as the message. And um, I mean, I really want to continue in the vein. We've had nine consecutive messages on the prophetic nature of the church using the Old Testament, using the New Testament, and even discussing some of the current events. And, and uh I, I want to do that today. I want to continue with some prophetic insights. First of all, I really I want to go and do a brief summary of those first 13 psalms, which we've read the last 13 days, so you understand there's, there's, there's a coherent picture that emerges there. 
But second, I want to address the situation we're in right now in America. And I, I, I want to say, and those of you who have listened to me, that it will be of no surprise since I've been saying the same thing for close to 40 years. The political issues are not the main issues right now. Everything with the Lord is theological, first and foremost. It's his purposes according to his word. And we need to understand that. And let me say, the results of the election uh, from the past week, or the potential results of the election from the past week, have not changed the fact that, for me, I believe the Lord wants to bring his church together first and foremost. And, and there, there are all kinds of reasons for it. I'm going to hopefully be able to share a few of those reasons for that today and in the future as we continue to, to look at these matters. According to what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, we, the church, we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. As the salt of the earth, we are preservative and transformative of, of what goes on around us in the earth. The church has an authority to preserve life and to transform it, culture and society around it by the power of the gospel. We are light. We bring revelation and discernment. We, we, we see what's really going on. We see from heaven's perspective what's going on. And, and, and we declare those things. And we point people to Jesus. Now, Scripture says if the salt has lost its flavor, what good is it to be just to be cast out underfoot by men and men trample it? The church cannot afford to lose its flavor. If, if we put a, a bushel over the lamp, the light that the church is, we're in darkness. The church cannot afford to do those things. I've said, this is America's situation particularly, but it's, it's, it's true in different ways in the church's testimony throughout the earth. When you have a church that is more committed to a political party than to its brothers and sisters in Christ, any political party. When you have a church that's, that sees itself as an American first and a Christian second, in other words, being more committed to America than it is to the body of Christ, than it is to Jesus and the gospel. We have a state in which the salt may lose its saltiness, its flavor the light may be put under a bushel. So we, in the body of Christ in this hour, are really faced with a challenge. And I've been saying, and, and, and I'll just throw it out there prophetically, as every, everybody puts their opinion out there and calls it prophetic, but as, as uh, is very clear in Deuteronomy, if a prophet says thus and so and it doesn't come to pass, don't believe that prophet. They have not spoken the word of the Lord. They've spoken a vision of their own heart. So I'll put mine out there as well. I believe that the unfolding events now and in the future are going to be designed for the Lord to bring his church together. Okay, so we have 13 Psalms. I, I want to do that overview and then I want to get into biblical understanding of what is going on right now. So Psalm 1 started out with the way of the righteous versus the way of the wicked. This is where the Genesis book starts, if we want a new beginning for the church. See, the Genesis book, it doesn't start with worship. It starts with character. It starts with righteousness. It starts with truth. And actually, in the first 13 Psalms, there's a heavy emphasis on the righteous versus the wicked. And see, the church needs to understand that we just don't jump into worship without righteousness. We get the, our righteousness from Christ, 
and then Christ progressively through the power of the Spirit works that righteousness out in us and delivers us from wickedness. The basic meaning of wickedness, that's, that's the, 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 the word um, that is being used in the Hebrew here, uh, the rasha'im, uh, that word wicked means rebellious. It means rebelling against the Lord as opposed to righteousness. So Psalm 1 starts out, this is where all the, where the paradigm, the prophetic paradigm, the eschatological paradigm of the book of Psalms, in other words, showing us how God works in human history, that's what eschatology is, starts with character. It starts with righteousness as opposed to wickedness. Psalm 2, the Lord sets his king on Zion. And that king is the Messiah, his anointed one, his son. So again, even before we get to worship, we start with God's standards of righteousness, and then we have the king. Our king is Jesus. And remember, the start of the kingship in Israel, where Israelites told Samuel, we want a king. That was a rejection of God being king. We can have leaders, but our leaders can't be our king. The Lord is our king. And so he establishes God's purposes in human history by a man, an anointed man, a king. And then we know that Psalms uh, 3, 4, 5, and 6 are just David crying out for prayer. So we have righteousness versus wickedness. We have God's king, and then we have prayer. And what I said uh, previously was 3, 4, 5, and 6. It said, here's our strategy for beginnings in the church, in the, among the people of God. We pray, we pray some more, we pray some more, and we pray some more. It's like that. Paul saying in Ephesians, pray without ceasing. You know, pray without stopping. It doesn't mean 24-7 prayer. It just means there's this constant orientation in a Christian, in a child of God, to pray first and foremost. And it's you notice it's morning prayers and evening prayers. Psalm 3 is a morning prayer. Psalm 4 is an evening prayer. Psalm 5 is a morning prayer. Psalm 6 is a prayer against sickness and illness. It's called pray in the morning pray in the evening, pray in all our circumstances. What is interesting, though, the first psalm of prayer is a psalm about internecine conflict. In other words, family conflict. The, the psalm starts right out with righteousness and wickedness, the Lord's anointed messianic king who's going to deliver us and give us our inheritance, and then right away it goes into family conflict. See, See, if we want new beginnings in the body of Christ, we need to deal with the family conflict that's going on in the body of Christ right now. So Psalm 7, then, if there's, there's another prayer. And uh, Psalm 7 starts like this. I'm in the ESV. The, the heading is, A Shigayon of David, which he sang to the Lord concerning the works of Cush, a Benjamite. Now, Shigayon is only used one other time in Scripture. It's used here, and it's used in the prayer of Habakkuk. If you read the prophetic book of Habakkuk, you'll find out what a Shigayon is, and it's in wrath, Lord, remember mercy. When your wrath comes forth and you judge nations, because Habakkuk was a prophet who was raised up by God when he was judging Israel, when he was judging Judah, when he was judging the na nation, and sending in the Babylonians to render God's judgment among God's people, Habakkuk shares a Shigayon in the Hebrew. It's a prophetic song, prophetic song crying out to God, deliver your people, Lord. But again, this is interesting because this is, again, internecine conflict. It's a, a, a psalm that David sang to the Lord. It's a prophetic song, just like Habakkuk did, concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite. We don't know who Cush the Benjamite was if, if, if we look through Scripture, but we do know this. David became king when Saul was removed from the kingship. Saul was the first king. He was a Benjamite. And, and as a Benjamite, he was removed from the kingship, and David from the tribe of Judah was raised up. You know, two different families, two different political parties. Look at it any way you want. 
but there was this change of power, this transformation of power, transition of power. God ordained it. And see, the Benjamites were angry and hurt because of that. People can be angry and people can be hurt. But, the, but David is crying out because someone in this transition of power is very angry with him and has cursed David. And David cries out to the Lord for deliverance. And the 17th verse, the final verse of Psalm 7 says, I will give to the Lord the thanks due to his righteousness, and I will sing praise to the name of the Lord, the Most High God. He just cries out, God, God help us through this internecine conflict. Psalm 8 was interesting because that was election day. And now all of a sudden, you know, all this prayer, you have prayers of David, prayers of help and protection and deliverance from Psalm 3, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And all of a sudden, you have a psalm that talks about this. How majestic is your name? O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Verse 3, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you set in place, what is man that you are mindful of man? And what is the son of man that you care for him? What is man? You, this, you're God, this awesome creation. And, and who are we? We're nothing compared to you, Lord, in your might and power. Verse 5 says, yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. We're, we're lower than the angelic host, the supernatural beings, the so-called gods with a small g, the powers and principalities. We're lower than the heavenly beings, and yet the Lord has crowned us with honor and glory and have given us dominion over the work of your hands, and you have put all things under your feet. And then, O oh Lord, our Lord, the psalm ends the same way it began. How majestic is your name in all the earth. What is majestic about the name of the Lord? That he gives man authority to exercise the Lord's dominion in the earth. And as I was reading this, and I'm praying about election day, the Lord said to me, What's the meaning of this psalm? And, and, and not thinking of the connection, I just said, well, this is that you've chosen man, that you've elected man to, 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 to run your world for you, Lord. And then all of a sudden it hit me, that you've elected man. And the Lord said, here's my choice on election day. I elect my church to carry out my kingdom in the earth. And the Lord began transforming my whole perspective of election day. Chapter 9 and 10, in, in many versions, ancient versions of the Psalms are a single psalm. And I can, I can tell you this very simply. 9 and 10 are about righteousness and wickedness. It, goes, it reverts back now. If man is going to receive dominion, God's authority to, to, to establish his kingdom in the earth in human history, we're back to righteousness and unrighteousness. And it's interesting because this talks about, these two psalms talk about the righteous ones versus the wicked one. The wicked one in the singular. The wicked one in the singular is, that's that's Second Thessalonians. That's the Antichrist. The wicked one is this, this power, this power of darkness that, that tries to dominate the earth in contrast to the Lord's people being given dominion in chapter 8. Psalm 8, in Psalm 9 and 10, the wicked one arises and attempts to take the authority in the earth. And you know, and go ahead and read these afterwards, but in 9 and 10, you know the primary aspect of wickedness? Wickedness goes after the vulnerable. Wickedness goes after the poor. Wickedness goes after the weak. Wickedness goes after the the oppressed, the wicked one, seeks to dominate human lives. It sees human beings as something to be dominated so that it can have power. Now, this, this is very important because, you know, it's, it's interesting just watching Christians and, and the comments Christians are making about what's going on with the election and this and that and 
this mentality of spiritual warfare. It's out there. And, 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 and I think that, like, like many other things in the body of Christ, there's a lot of false prophecy and a lot of false teaching out there. When we see human beings, not the way Jesus sees human beings, we have problems. How does Jesus see human beings? The Great Commission. He said, go make disciples of all the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything I've commanded with you. And lo, I am with you always. Behold, look, see, I'm with you always, even on the end of age, to establish discipleship. See, see, the Lord Jesus sees people, human beings, as candidates for the Great Commission, as candidates for discipleship. The Lord sees People as people. He loves people. When we talk about Psalm 8, if we're going to exercise the Lord's authority in the earth, if we're going to exercise it in the earth on his behalf, how do we exercise it? We look at people as being, their people are an opportunity to, to have access to the blessing of a good creator, a good creator, a good God. And he invites people into his kingdom through faith in Jesus, repentance from sin. But it's it's about love. People are not seen the way they're seen in Psalm 9 and 10 by the wicked one. They're, they're, they're objects of warfare to be conquered. I mean, when, I, when I listen to the rhetoric coming from the church, from the body of Christ, and how people are seen. They're seen as objects to be controlled, objects to be dominated. That is counter from the gospel. That's counter from the way Jesus went. In fact, when Jesus came, that's why Jesus was crucified, because Jesus went right for the poor, the weak, the broken, the vulnerable, and he stood against those in authority who saw authority as a means to dominate control people's lives. And Jesus stood against that and said, nope, no, it's not the gospel. I've said this over and over. Jesus, his greatest manifestation of wrath, and we read last week in, in, in Revelation chapter 6, we need to hide from the wrath of the Lamb. There is a wrath of the Lamb. There is a wrath that Jesus has. And when we look at where the wrath of the Lamb was directed in the Gospels, it was toward the scribes and the Pharisees. Why? Because they saw people as simply a means to an end to establish their dominion and their authority. And they used the scripture to do it. Rome used crucifixes to do it, but the Pharisees used the scripture to do it. And remember what Jesus said about the Pharisees. Oh, you got to listen to what they say. It's not necessarily what they say that's wrong. It's what they do. And see, what God wants to do is remove Phariseeism from the church right now. We, we can have all the truth we want. We can preach all the truth we want. But is our design like Jesus' design? Or is our design like the wicked one who tries to dominate people in Psalms 9 and 10? Which brings us to 11. And I want to look at 11. And Jan and I have already looked at 12 and 13. But 11 says, again, it's David. As he's faced with this paradox of righteousness versus wickedness, of the righteous of God's people versus the wicked one, this is what he says. Psalm 11, verse 1. In the Lord I take refuge. How can you say to my soul, Flee like a bird to your mountain. Now see, David is saying, I am going to take refuge in the Lord. But there's this, there's this alternate voice out there. This alternate voice that says, oh no, no, no you, you don't want to take refuge in the Lord. You want to flee like a bird to your... You want to flee like a bird to your mountain. 
And the voice continues. This is a this is a this is false prophecy. For behold, the wicked bend the bow, they have fitted their arrow to the string to shoot in the dark at the upright in heart. Now that's a voice that's countering David's trajectory to hide himself in the Lord. And look at that voice, that false voice. It's fear. See, people use fear to control. The fear of the Lord sets us free from other fears. The fear of the Lord, and, and the fear of the Lord is going to come in in the rest of this psalm, where David says, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not. I'm not going to listen to that voice. Flee. Flee like a bird into the mountain, because the enemy's going to destroy us. And then there's a question that's posed. And I don't know if it's the voice of, of, of falsehood asking the question, or it's just David. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? See, we're back to the righteous. We've got the righteous and the wicked one in Psalms 9 and 10. And now we've got, what can the righteous do? And see, this is what false power, abuse of power, non-kingdom, non-gospel sourced power tries to do to the righteous. It tries to destroy the foundations, the very foundations of the building. And by the way, this is what the rabbis said, because I, I, I interact with, with, with rabbinic study. Well, I want to see what, 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 my, what my forefathers uh, of Israel said about these passages. And the Jews said that the foundations are mercy and justice, not power. See, there, see, see nations, whether, it's, whether it's, it's, it's Russia or it's China or it's America or it's ISIS, any nation in the world, nations see foundations primarily coming from exercise of power. Do you know that Jesus doesn't see it that way? In fact, this is what Jesus said. He said, okay, you guys think you're powerful, all right? So do what you got to do. They put him to death. They exercise fearful, intimidating power. Jesus submitted to it. Jesus, hey, Jesus followed Romans 13. He submitted to authority. And he rose from the dead. And when he rose from the dead, he said, no. Human power does not have the final say. The foundations are mercy. The foundations are justice. And when the foundations are mercy and justice, you have the gospel. You have grace. You have faith. You have redemption, you have reconciliation, not brute force of power. And somewhere along the line, the church got into this brute force of power is how we're going to demonstrate the kingdom of God. And all the church is doing is aligning itself with the world's view of the foundation. We force people to do things. Jesus doesn't force anybody to do things. Mercy, justice, grace transforms our hearts. Now the church still, the church has a big job to do in this hour. The gospel has to transform people's hearts. Not governments or political parties. They have their place. If, if, if you guys will uh, allow me, I'll, I'll, I'll finish that today. But if not, you know, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll save it for next week. I want to show you about human government. Human government is ordained by God, but it has limits. What are the limits? It's not the gospel. And human governments are established to keep order in the earth. And that's, that's not a bad thing. But human governments cannot bring mercy, cannot bring justice, cannot bring redemption. Only the gospel. See, and that's, that's the difference. That's a, I mean, human cries for justice, they, they might be biblical justice, they might not be biblical justice. But, they, but, but human cries for justice are basically philosophical. They, 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 they try to get people to change their understanding of things. On the other side of the coin, law and order, it, it, it enforces justice. It forces justice on people. What neither does is transform the heart. That's the gospel. And church, if we don't get it now, well, 
It's, things are just going to keep going the way they're going. The church has to rise up in the power of the gospel. I don't, I don't care what Lord of the Harvest ends up being. If we end up being 10 people at Lord of the Harvest, because, you know, my version of church growth is to, the, at one time our church was 200 people, and then we started integrating, and oh, guess what, now we're 150, and then other things happen, and now we're 100. Who knows? Church growth, we're shrinking. We're becoming more like Gideon's army. Uh, you know, the Lord says, oh, there, there are too many people. Like, too many people, Lord, come on. But however many we shrink down to, we're going to keep with the simple message, the gospel transforms. So 11.3 says, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And then here's the answer. The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes see, his eyes see, his eyelids test the children of men. The Lord tests the righteous but his soul abhors the wicked and the one who loves violence. It's interesting that the Lord equates the wicked one. See, we're back righteous and wicked in here. But David's saying, help me. How, how do we become righteous and you save us from the, the wicked one? Well, the Lord's in his holy temple. Come on in. Come on in and be with the Lord. But it's interesting. He, he defines all through here wickedness. Wickedness are those who love violence. Let the Lord, let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. The answer is, let's behold the face of the Lord. And of course, we, we, I already read Psalm 12 at the start, and it's the contrast between false words that seek to, a false narrative that seeks to, in, in, in capture, to, to, to place the minds of God's people in the bondage versus the word of the Lord. And then Jan started with 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? The psalmist is crying out, Lord, it's been a long time and we're, we're not seeing the fruit. We're not seeing the results. Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Light up my eyes, give me revelation, lest I sleep the sleep of death, lest my enemy say I have prevailed over him, lest my foes rejoice because I am shaken. How will we, the people of God, overcome the wicked one? Well, I have trusted in your hesed, your steadfast love. There's the answer. We trust in his steadfast love and our heart rejoices in his salvation. And remember, the word for salvation in Hebrew is Yeshua. And, and I, I, was, uh, I just started doing that many years ago. Whenever I see in the Old Testament, we're going to rejoice in your salvation. It means we're going to rejoice in your Yeshua. We're going to rejoice in your Jesus. We're going to rejoice in our King, our Lord, our Master, the one who laid down his life that we might live. I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your Yeshua. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. Part one is finished. We, we, we have a pattern here. The righteous versus the wicked. Part two. Go with me to Romans chapter 13. Now, we got some time, we can do this. All right. Okay. I'm gonna maybe get closer to the speaker here. Maybe I'll, I'm louder, I'm, I'm getting text. Speak louder, I'm so loud, I can't, I don't even know how to speak louder. But here is Romans 13. Romans 13 is that passage that Christians often refer to to deal with the issue of submission to govern. All right. Well, let's read Romans 13 in context. I mean, it's one thing to read 
13, 1 through 7, but we, 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 we're forgetting if we don't read some verses in chapter 12 before that and some verses in chapter 13 after it to get the context. Here is how we lead into this passage about government. Paul starts out with, and he's actually talking about relationship to individuals, to human beings. And then he goes into this idea about government, and then he goes back to human beings. Human beings, we'll start with verse 18. We, we could really start earlier than that because actually in verse 9, he's just talking about how we coexist as human beings. We might as well look at it. Uh, 12.9, let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the need of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Don't be proud and arrogant and just run with the rich and the famous and the powerful. Hang out with the poor, the broken, the hurting, the oppressed, the vulnerable. And it actually says that if we don't associate with the poor, if we don't value the poor, if we don't value the, the broken, the hurting, not just in, in, in our, our, our nation, but in the nations of the earth, we are acting haughty. We are acting arrogant. If, if, if people's social circle is devoid of the vulnerable, in other words, if you don't party with the people Jesus partied with, and remember, he, he got criticized for the people he partied with because he partied with the poor. He partied with the, with the people on the outs. The outliers, that's, that's who he, he partied with. He, it says, you're, you're already, you're, you're, there's, there's a pride at work in you, and pride blinds the heart and the mind to truth. Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, as far as depends on you, live peaceably with everyone. Now, verses 9 through 18 I would say, is basically a mandate to cancel Facebook. That's the first century mandate to cancel Facebook because we don't do those things on Facebook. And see, what happened is, is initially when Facebook started out, we were nasty on Facebook to people, but we we're still nice to people uh, in, in person. Well, that Facebook has transformed us. We're nasty to people on Facebook and in person. That's, that's not consistent with Romans at this point in Romans. So then he says, verse 19, here's where the argument starts that leads into government. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it or leave vengeance to the wrath of God, for it is written. Now, the word to avenge yourself is to establish justice on forcible terms. Never, and he's talking to the church right now. He's talking to the church. Not, not, he's not talking to government right now. He's talking to the church. He's saying, never seek to establish justice in this forcible, violent way as a Christian. Never do that. He says, for it says we're to leave that to the wrath of God. Now, there was wrath of God. Remember that one about the coals coming down on, the Lord's going to bring down the coals on the wicked one? <laughs> okay. Who, by the way, who is the Lord bringing the coals down? Who are the wicked ones? Well, that's all those wicked people. Up no, that's people in power who abuse their power. And, and that's what we're going we're, we're gonna, we're gonna to talk a bit about that for, for the rest of, of, of the moment. To whom much is given, much shall be required. The Lord isn't into bringing coals of fire on 
the poor and the oppressed and the broken. But he is into bringing coals of fire on people who have power and authority, who misuse power and authority, who abuse power and authority. Now, power and authority can still deal with criminals. I, I, I understand that. But, but we have to understand the biblical perspective. God goes after those in charge first. Okay? That's, that's what the Lord does. That's just reality. So, you know, that's one of those things. It's the moment God gives us a position of authority, he just painted a bullseye on us. That's why I tell people, well, don't be too quick to want to be a prophet or an apostle or a pastor. The moment you come into a place of authority, you got a bullseye on you because now you are going to be required by God to act. There's a level of responsibility for people in authority that people who aren't in authority do not have on their shoulders. Leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. I'll take care. I'll take care of justice. I, the Lord, will take care of justice, where there is injustice. And it continues, it says, To the contrary, and then it quotes, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. That's what we're supposed to do with our human enemies. We're to feed our enemies. If our enemy is thirsty, we're to give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. See, that's the burning coals, really. The God's burning coals are redemptive. They're always redemptive. It might look in the Psalms like the Lord's going to chop their heads off. It's redemptive. Coals of fire are to purify, to refine to purge people. And see, this is what the this is how the church is supposed to do things. We don't see cut off those, I don't know, fill in the bank, cut off those left wingers, cut off those Trump supporters, cut them off. That's that's not gospel, that's not biblical, that's not God, that's not true, that's not righteous. That's the impulse of the wicked one. And see, the church has to wake up. We have to wake up and come out of wickedness and come into righteousness. Righteousness is doing it God's way, and God's way is the way of the gospel. And then it says, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I, I quoted the, the song by you too a couple weeks ago. The Lord requires it. I think the words were by you too, and I, I kind of think they, they got them from somewhere else, but uh, you know, Bono reads a lot, and he probably got it from some philosopher or theologian. But it says, we can't become the monster. We can't become a monster to destroy the monster. See, that's, that's, this, is, this is the polarity that's in the churches. We're becoming monsters to destroy the monster. And that is not biblical. That is not righteousness. That is the way of wickedness. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. We are called to overcome evil with the goodness of God, the grace of God. Now, that goes right into Romans 13. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. This is government now. And, and remember, he's writing to the Romans. This is the heart of the Roman Empire, the capital of the world, the capital of the greatest nation that ever existed on the face of the earth. That's how the Romans saw them. The Romans saw themselves as God's chosen nation to bring Roman order to the entire world. And, and, and so he's dealing with Roman believers, and he says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Okay, spoiler alert. I just want you to see that these words will not be used anywhere. And these are words that are, have been used. Remember, there have been 12 chapters of Romans. And in Romans, what's being exalted is the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm not ashamed of God's grace. I have faith in God's grace. God's grace brings justice. God's grace brings justification by faith. God's grace brings redemption. God's grace brings reconciliation. You have all of these words. The church is the vessel of, of, of God's grace grace, righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Spirit. All these gospel words that are used to describe the church will not be used 
at any point in this description of government. Government has a very simple task before it. It is given authority by God, but you're not going to see gospel words applied anywhere to government. You know why? Because government can't bring the fruit of the gospel. Government cannot produce. It's not here. It's here to keep order. And some governments do it better than others. Some governments do it more righteously than others. But government cannot transform people's hearts. Government. Government cannot bring people into the gospel. Government is not redemptive. It's about keeping order. And when the church begins to attribute godlike gospel status to the government or any party in the government, the church is off. Paul wrote this in the midst of a context. And the context is that we live in a world ruled by sin and death, but Jesus came in to establish God's kingdom and release his grace. And, and true justice, God takes care of true justice. The church brings justice. The gospel brings justice. All human government does is it seeks to establish order in the midst of the chaos of sin and death that's in the world. But see, the church is another vehicle altogether. Now watch. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Obedience is a word that's used all throughout Romans. Obedience is a, an allegiance word. We are called to obey the Lord because he's our king, because he's our Lord, because God's purposes is to establish his kingdom in the earth through the Messiah. That's, that's, that's obedience. We are not called to obey government. We're called to place ourselves under the authority of government. And watch. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. We're not, we're, we're called to be, this is what Paul is saying is we're called to be good citizens, but we are citizens of God's kingdom way before we're citizens of the earth. And we need to understand that. We want to be good citizens because we want to see evil restrained and goodness have a greater chance to spread. We want to see the gospel spread. Now, I, I, I will tell you this, the gospel is spread whatever kind of government the gospel's under, whether it's under an oppressive, unrighteous, Christian persecuting government, or whether it's under a, a, a free system, a, a liberal system, a democratic system, a republic system, a system of, of being a republic. The gospel's gonna, going to flourish regardless. I repeat verse 2, Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers, now I want you to understand something here. This is what people just aren't getting. Paul has now called government, he's used two terms that he uses in Ephesians chapter 6. He's called government powers and principalities. The authority is the power behind government, and the rulership is principalities, powers and principalities. Now, Paul is going to have a very flattering view of government here in Romans 13 that he does not have in Ephesians chapter 6. And unless we realize that Paul's using, Paul's writing in Greek. If, if you saw this in Greek, you'd, you'd see it clearly. Rulers, verse 3, are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Why would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Do what is good, and you will receive his approval, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he or it, it is the government, he or it does not bear the sword in vain, for he is a servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So understand, the purpose of government is to keep order. 
within the framework of keeping order, government can provide infrastructure, it can provide economic policies, government can restrain evil, government can punish evil, government can enforce righteous laws, government can do those things, but government doesn't transform people's hearts. There's no language in here, the government ministers grace. There's no, there's no language that says the government establishes justice. There's no language that says the government redeems anybody. And so we need to see government is a necessary evil. And see, when Christians begin to give God-like status, America, 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 and our allegiance becomes like God to any governmental system, to any party. We are on the fringes of idolatry because we are attributing God-like status to powers that are simply there to bring order. They have a sword. They cause fear. It doesn't matter. I could be driving 10 miles under the speed limit and a police officer goes by and my heart stops. Oh my God, oh, am I driving too fast? And I'll probably get a ticket for driving too slow. See, there's that authority. There's, there's fear. And that's conscience. Our conscience is linked to respect authority. And we're supposed to respect authority. But authority does not bring justice. And we're going to say, well, well what happens when a, when a government begins to topple justice? Well, we'll, we'll take a look. We'll take a look. Verse 5, therefore one must be in subjection, never obedience. Obedience is an allegiance word to Jesus. Faith is an obedience word to Jesus, an allegiance word to Jesus. We don't have faith in the government. We don't obey the government. We submit to the order that the government's bringing. And we, we are going to be good citizens. We work toward being good citizens. We work toward bringing our country together. But God and the gospel changes hearts. Therefore, one must be in subjection not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For the same reason, you must also pay taxes. For authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed. Respect to whom respect is owed. Honor to whom honor is owed. Uh, I think King James says, render to all what is owed to him. Now that, it goes back to a scripture that Jesus said. Remember Jesus, they were asking him, well, here, look at this coin, you know, uh, do we pay taxes to Caesar or not? And Jesus says, give me that coin. You render to Caesar, what is Caesar? And that's the same word that's used right here in this passage. We render certain things that are due to those in authority, but you render to God what is God's. When a government begins, and a government crosses a line, when number one, it begins to ascribe to itself God-like status, it's crossed a line. You render to Caesar what is Caesar. You render to God what is God. And we have to understand this. We need to recognize this. But notice, just as it gets done saying, pay this if you owe this to this one, and pay that if you owe this to that one. And he's talking about the things we owe to government, but then immediately, look what he goes to in the verses after. Then he turns around and says, owe no one anything. Well, wait a second, you just said, you, 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 pay, pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. Because the Lord is saying, yes, there's an authority in government, but and, and, and you need to submit to that authority. But when it comes to people, let's get back to the gospel. People are not the government. The government is an entity. It's a soulless entity established by God for order in their it's not human beings. You know that Jesus, you know Democrats, you know Jesus wants to save Republicans. You know Republicans, Jesus wants to save Democrats. You know white people, 
Jesus wants to save black people. Black people, Jesus wants to save white people. And when it comes to human beings, here's what we owe. Owe no one anything except to love each other. And see, we handle government differently from the way we handle people. And the church and this nation's got it mixed up right now because we're treating people like they're objects to be controlled instead of saying, no, 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 not objects to be controlled human beings to be loved, to bring them in, to bring them in to what God has for them. I'm having a, 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 a soon-to-be power outage, so the Lord will determine how long this message goes. Almost finished. Read these last few verses. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. Now, these are all commandments. We, we don't do those things. And we have commandments about abortion. We have commandments about homosexuality. We have all kinds of commandments, but the Lord is saying, but through Paul, but you can sum all those commandments up very easily. Not by human legislation, but by the gospel. The gospel deals with those things. And he says, all those commandments, and I'll add a few. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not murder. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. You shall not abort babies. You shall not uh, uh, be a homosexual. Any other commandments are summed up in this word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. Do you hear us, church? Do you hear the us, the word, the Holy Spirit and the word? Love. Government can't do that. Now, go to, with me to Ephesians 6, because the same language Paul used in Romans that causes a, a lot of people to say, oh, we, we, just, we just have to listen to government. Well, what does listen to government mean? We're to submit. We're to, we're to follow it when it brings God's order. But we're not to obey it. We don't, we don't have an allegiance with government that we reserve for God and God alone. Because what happens if the government goes rogue? What happens if the government becomes the wicked one? Wh whichever party is in. Whichever country in the earth is. What happens? Well, then we have some problems. Render to Caesar what is Caesar's, but Caesar cannot usurp God's authority. Look at Ephesians 6. This is our famous warfare passage. Ephesians 6.10, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now watch, we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. It's not about human beings to be conquered, human beings to be destroyed, human beings to be erased, human beings to be eviscerated. We fight not against flesh and blood. With flesh and blood, we love. With powers and principalities, we fight. We fight against these systems of authority that are at place in every nation of the world. When they do God's will, thank you, Jesus. When they don't do God's will, the church has to rise up. And what I say by resist, we, 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 we resist by the way we live our lives. We become an opposite. We become an opposite living standard of grace, of redemption, of healing, of faith in the Lord, of the gospel. That's what we become. That's how you resist the powers. We don't take up weapons of warfare to resist the powers. We don't, we don't embrace violence. That's what, what, what the psalmist said. Violence is associated with the wicked ones. We don't do those things. We rise up in the power of the gospel. We look like Jesus. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. The rulers and the authorities, the powers and principalities, the same words used to describe government in Romans 13. Powers and principalities, rulers and authorities. That's 
what we make war against. And we make war against them in the spirit. We make war against them in the spirit, not in the flesh. And, and by the way, getting on Facebook and demonizing people, that's the weapons of the flesh. That's not the weapons of, of, of spiritual warfare. We fight against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers that are over this present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil. Where are they? In heavenly places. I'm gonna, I, I, I don't have time to do it today. I'm going to do it next week, though. And I'm, I'm going to demonstrate these premises that I'm, I'm, I'm laying out in principle. I'm going to demonstrate them from Scripture. Psalms gives us a lot of insight. The book of Daniel gives us a lot of insight about powers and principalities. But let's, let's, let's finish up with Ephesians 6. This is how the church is supposed to do spiritual warfare. And remember, the warfare is against rulers, authorities, narratives, stories, things in the heavenly places, not human beings. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth. Truth is a way that we make war against powers and principalities. We counter their falsehood with the truth of the gospel. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness, righteousness, the way we live out our lives, like Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, graciously, redemptively. We, 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 that's how we counter powers and principalities, truth, righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, the gospel, we make war by proclaiming the gospel, believing the gospel, living the gospel, embracing people in the power of the gospel, welcoming people into the reconciliation that's the basis of the gospel. And it's just not the gospel, it's the gospel of peace. Shalom. Shalom is God's blessing. The gospel of peace is our creator wants to bless his entire creation. And Psalm 8 says, church, I've given you authority to do this. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Faith. See, I, I want us to get a different understanding of faith. Faith isn't, isn't just about power. We've seen there's an abuse of power in the world and in the church right now. And in America, there's an abuse of power. So let's 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 throw that I that association of faith with power out the window for, for a moment. God does give us power, but it's power to, to, to bring blessing into people's lives. Faith is an allegiance word. I've used that a number of times. Faith says, my allegiance is to Jesus Christ. And see, that's how you break the power of the devil in your life. It isn't just screaming and howling, I rebuke you, Satan, in the name of Jesus. I bind you. Do that. I do it all the time. But faith is, I serve my Lord. And my Lord is the master of the universe. So devil, say what you want to. Do what you want to. My Lord is your Lord too. See, that's faith. We, we need to understand faith. We need to abstract some of this drive of power. I, I've seen so many Christians' lives be shipwrecked because all they wanted was power power to accomplish some kind of goals in their lives. That's not faith, brother. That's not faith. And take the helmet of salvation. Salvation is a weapon of our warfare. A helmet. We put salvation on our mind. The, we said last week, Revelation 7, the Lord has marked us in our foreheads with a mark that protects us from the judgment that's coming on the earth. That's salvation. That's deliverance. God is there to deliver not only his people, but all the other people that his people are ministering to. Be a source of deliverance for people. Bring them out of the darkness and into the light. And the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, the Word of God, is part of our weaponry to defeat rogue powers and principalities. 
take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And finally, it closes, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Pray at in the morning, pray in the evening, pray in the morning again, pray, 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 and pray again. Pray without ceasing. This is this is this this is framing this. Now I'm going to conclude with something that I've tried to establish today, and then give you a preview of next week. When do powers and principalities those those ruling authorities that God has given to each nation, and we'll we'll talk about that more next week. When do they go rogue? Well, they go rogue whenever a government, whenever a political party. Whenever a, a someone in authority begins to attribute godlike status to itself, that's beast power, not Christ power, not messianic power. It's beast power. That's 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 something that we have to be careful. Of. And Christians are struggling. We have struggled from the birth of this nation, and actually the struggle goes back further than the birth of this nation. We have struggled with this issue of political power. Political power is a blessing and a curse because political power is not, it's never redemptive. It's just, it's, it's soulless power. It can enforce righteousness, but it can't, it, it can enforce righteousness on people from without, but it cannot do it from within, which is what the gospel does. The gospel transforms us from within. So rogue power, rogue authority, rogue principalities and powers, and where Paul spoke positively in Romans 13 has got to be contrasted with how Paul spoke about it here in Ephesians 6. Rulers of the darkness of this world. And remember, Ephesus was under the Roman Empire just as the Romans were. And it's like Paul's kind of using a little code here. He's telling the Roman citizens, the Christians, be good citizens. But then he's telling the Ephesians, but be careful if Rome goes rogue. And my suspicion is, as we read Paul's writings, because remember, Ephesians is probably written about seven, eight years after Romans. So in Romans, Paul had a more positive view of, of Rome. He has, it's, it's, things are starting to seep through in his, in his mindset. And see, church, the church, you know, you, if you have a positive view of America, well, praise the Lord. But you know what, church? We've got to start seeing what's really going on here. We really have to start seeing what's going on. And it's going to come. It's going to come whether we whether we obey God and have faith in God or whether we struggle and, and the Lord has to discipline us. It's going to come. It's, 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 it's going to come. And um, the second thing, and this is for next week, the other place where governments go rogue, where the power and the rulership and the authority that God entrusts to government for the good of the people begins to go rogue, godlike status, we've talked about that today. Next week, we're going to talk about injustice. When a government begins to move more by injustice than justice, the power and principality, it's going rogue. And 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 we'll, we'll, we'll have plenty of time to do that next week in Scripture. So, we're closing. Thank you for listening. Thank you for uh, being patient. We'll, we might be at Lord of the Harvest next week. We might still be online here. We are, we're, we're, we're praying for our brothers and sisters in the faith who are, are, uh, are struggling right now. A lot of people are struggling with COVID-19. This is in the church, in the body of Christ, or being exposed to people. It's 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 starting to pick up again. It's starting, you know, we 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 had our 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 uh, uh, summer affair, you know, um, but see you in September. You know, we 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 we're starting to get back to those same kinds of realities that we found ourselves in March and in April, and the church is just going to have to negotiate its way through. So we close down for, for those reasons. This week, we'll see what happened next week. There, my, my son is, 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 is giving me a little suggestions here. He, he, we should let him uh, 
comment, but he reminded me that Paul said, and I believe he said it in, in Corinthians, he wrestled with the beasts of Ephesus. And see, so, so Paul, remember Ephesus was a center of magic, of, of, of all this like illegitimate spiritual power, and Paul faced that in Ephesus, and so then he, he kind of starts changing his view on, uh, on, on just how good government is, and, and the possibility of, of good government is still there in Romans 13, but he reminds us in Ephesians 6, it can go rogue. So thank you, Joel Osminski, for the quote. Paul wrestled with the beasts of Ephesus. I'm going to close in prayer. Father, I come before your throne in Jesus' name. I pray for the church first and foremost. Lord, may your church rise up to what it's called to be in this hour. Lord, I know for 50 years I've preached about the church, the church, the church. I was a kid, and the Lord put the church and the revelation of Jesus Christ in the midst of that church on my heart. Lord, for 40 years, Lord, I, I mean, for 50 years, I, I've preached, let your church become the church and rise up in the name of Jesus. Second, I've preached for 40 years that government, American government, can step across boundaries and interfere with the church's allegiance to Jesus Christ. I'm praying, Lord, help your church to establish our allegiance to Christ and the gospel before anything and everything else in the name of Jesus. Third, Lord, I pray for our nation right now. It's another thing I wanted to talk about, how the, there's so many similarities between our nation right now, where our nation is uh, now, and where it was in the brink of the Civil War, Father. And, and uh, Lord, I, I just pray for our nation. I pray that you will raise up leaders, Lord God, who will help negotiate this nation and, and get it back on the other side of the line where it's simply a Romans 13 government. It's, it's just, it's there for, for the common good. It's there to establish order, Lord, and peace, Lord. And, 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 and therefore, it's citizens, Father. Where we've crossed the line in terms of allegiance and, 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 and seeing America as something equal to or greater than God, help us, Father, help us. But there has to be a church. There has to be a church that, that is raised up in this hour, Lord. There has to be a church that is salt and is light. Father, grant that unto us in the name of Jesus. And the final thing I want to pray for, the church needs... If there's a new beginning the church needs, we need a new beginning in understanding justice, Lord. How central justice, biblical justice. It, again, it's one of the two marks that qualifies or disqualifies human government. Justice, Lord. And, and, and not usurping God-like authority. Help our country. Help our people, help our church, and finally, again, a second finally, help the body of Christ to make war where it needs to make war with powers and principalities and love where it needs to love people. Grant that unto us, Father. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen. God bless you.